So just before I introduce our webinar series, I want to start by saying some thank yous, um, because this is the third um, of uh, and final of our three part webinar series. So we had one last Wednesday on the 4th and we had one um, just yesterday. Um, so before I wrap the webinar series up, I want to thank you, um, the amazing organizations who have supported and enabled our six year coastal economies program at NAF. We are very grateful in particular to the support of the Kalusku Banking Foundation for making it possible for us to set up the Center for Coastal Economies program and to deliver our work in the past few years. And I'm really delighted that Louisa Hooper is here with us today and you'll hear from her in a bit. We are also incredible, grateful, incredibly grateful for the support of the John Alleman Foundation, the Waterloo Foundation and Local Trust who have been supporting different projects as part of our program from working with low impact fishers in making their post-Brexit concerns and recommendations heard at Westminster to supporting a peer learning network of local leaders in coastal communities around the English coast as part of the Local Trust Big Local program, to our ongoing work to ensure that those trying to deliver innovative approaches to managing our coast have the investment and policy support that they need. So I also want to thank the hundreds of people, literally, <laughs> that I've spoken with and that I've met over the past few years. Um, people that work within government, members of parliament, academics, industry representatives, NGOs, coastal residents, and just overall coastal champions who share their stories, their expertise, and gave their time um, to help us put together the Blue New Deal action plan for the UK coast <clears throat> and have been working um, since then and way before then <laughs> on putting those ideas into practice. And finally, I just want to thank the UK coast <laughs> itself um, because I was born and raised in Rio in Brazil um, and we have pretty incredible coastline um, and beaches. And I can say as someone who grew up and certainly misses the warm weather you know, on the beach day, that that is not the only way you can have an amazing time on the coast. The UK coast is magical. Um, it's so diverse and it encourages your creativity on the kind of things and the kind of fun that you can have by the ocean in all sorts of weather. And I've had the privilege of exploring so many parts of our UK coastline. Um, some of my favorites are Camber Sands, Rosilli Bay in Wales and Scarborough, um, but there are many others. Um, this year, I was so grateful um, not to even consider flying it anywhere. It has actually been quite refreshing. <laughs> um, and the two weeks I spent in Scotland back in July, most of it at the top north um, of the island um, in the small coastal community of Morven, um, looking out at the Orkney Islands was the most precious experience I had during this very challenging time that we've all been living through um, in a pandemic. So enough about me, um, let's get back to why we're here today. Um, so just briefly, you know, since 2015, the New Economics Foundation has been working with coastal communities and networks to deliver Blue New Deal for the UK coast. It's co-developed um, by hundreds of people from all regions of the UK. And this action plan, it's a comprehensive vision and action plan to create good jobs, economic and climate resilience for coastal communities, whilst at the same time restoring and protecting the natural ecosystems on which they depend. In our first webinar last week, we heard from different projects and initiatives in coastal communities in England and Scotland Speakers shared successes and learnings from work over the past five years to deliver local change and also discussed the real challenges of doing things in places against the backdrop of an economic and political system not supportive of transformative efforts. The COVID-19 crisis is profoundly impacting what were already fragile cost economies. This crisis has exposed and exacerbating, it's ex exacerbating long-standing socioeconomic challenges. Coastal towns have been identified as the most vulnerable to the economic impact of lockdown measures by a number of reports so far. Just yesterday at our second webinar, we zoomed out and we heard from speakers leading research and analysis into the structural issues facing our coastal areas, placing coastal challenges into a broader national context. Now the different pieces of evidence and considerations that were presented of complex social, economic, political, environmental, and cultural issues are extremely important because coastal voices have had an ongoing struggle 
to translate their lived experience and complex challenges into political action and, poli and policy change. But as I said, we have in one of the most stunning and diverse coastal landscapes of any country in the world and a unique coastal cu culture and heritage. Our coast has still unmet potential for solar, wind and marine renewable energy. Many of the natural solutions to the climate emergency, including carbon capture, can be found in the restoration of our coastal habitats um, and our marine biodiversity, which are also vital food source for the UK. And finally, the proven health and well-being benefits of access to blue space could not be more relevant and important in a post-COVID world. So there's no question that our coast seas and our coastal communities are key to driving the green recovery. And investing on the coast is also how we can make a fair recovery in the UK. So today for our first, third, sorry, and final session, we will focus on building or perhaps strengthening what I like to call a coastal movement um, that is building up in this country. Given where we are in the context we have, what needs to happen now? How can we take all these lessons from the past five years and the solutions we've been building to support coastal recovery? Not just short-term lived recovery, but doing the things now that will build a long-term positive sustainable change that will deliver happiness, social and economic resilience and support nature to thrive. So how can we work together and effectively deliver a new UK coastal narrative that is no longer about deprivation and feelings of being left behind, but more about celebration and pride. And to answer some of these questions, our first speakers will touch on the need for coastal collaboration. So I'll stop now and I'll hand it over to Louisa Hooper. Louisa leads the Calouste Kubankin Foundation UK branches environment work, which over the last few years has focused on increasing collabor collaborative action for marine protection and how to communicate the value of the ocean more effectively. Key initiatives include the marine collaboration, supporting a diverse group of NGOs to work together to explore new approaches. So Louisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Fernando, and thank you for inviting me to introduce this first session on collaboration and also for uh, reminding us of the amazing treasure of the UK coast. I think we should always, always keep that at the heart of all, all discussions. Um, so with such a, an amazing lineup of collaborative experts to follow, I'm going to be uh, really brief. Um, as you heard from um, Fernanda um, Gulbenkian, we've been supporting this work um, from the beginning and actually we're deeply committed to the value of collaboration in creating change. And I think that's for two main and really very obvious reasons. One is that if people work together, they have a stronger, louder voice. Um, and two, that we need people and organizations with a diversity of views, skills, and experience working together in order to find better, more holistic, more in the round solutions to the complex, entrenched and entirely interdependent social, economic and environmental challenges we face. This I think is even more true for the marine and coastal environment and the, com and the communities that depend on it, both at the coast, but actually across the country and, and, and beyond. So that's why over the last few years, our Valuing the Ocean program at the Gulbenkian Foundation um, has focused work on strengthening collaboration and communication. And those are two sides of the same coin, I would argue. And why we've been keen supporters of the work NEF and others have been doing over the last five years. Fernanda has asked me to say what progress I've seen over this period. Um, and I guess in short, I think it's been significant and there's much to celebrate in this, even given the difficult times we find ourselves in. So I remember very early on a workshop run by NEF uh, as part of its Blue New Deal work, which brought together organizations from different sectors, tourism, renewable energy, environmental NGOs, local authorities and others, all in the same room, all speaking to each other. And it really felt quite new, even, even daring 
um, it was clear that many people hadn't met before and the sense of potential of the opportunity and excitement of shared agendas and collaborative action was palpable. Now, five years on, many of those people know each other well and are regularly working together, as you will hear from some of the following speakers. The work of NEF and others has connected over 800 organisations and individuals working at the coast or on coastal issues. There are cross-sectoral initiatives happening around the coast which take seriously the prosperity and well-being of coastal communities underpinned by a healthy marine and coastal environment. Um, and just as importantly, and I think one of the kind of key successes of the work that NEF and others have been doing, is that that local work in coastal communities is connected to a larger national policy conversation. Um, and evidence of this came very recently. It was very exciting to see the recent submission to the Chancellor for the Comprehensive Spending Review, a clear evidenced and collaborative call for investment in coastal recovery, social and environmental, from the key networks representing local government, business um, and civil society at the coast. And um, obviously there are challenges around any investment at the moment, but um, it was a very strong and compelling case and really spoke to this kind of sustained work over the last five years in building those, those collaboration and that shared agenda and vision for the future. I'm also um, truly heartened by some of the shifts we're beginning to see in government in a willingness to collaborate and open up decision making to uh, local communities. For example, in NEF's first webinar last week, we heard from Ashling Lannan at the Marine Management Organization about some of the recommendations that are coming out of the Marine Pioneer Programme. And really that's, that's kind of about putting people and what they value at the heart of the discussions around the marine and coastal environment in order to ensure that people and the natural world we all depend on thrive together. There's much more uh, I could say, um, but I think that's a good place to stop um, and to hand on, I'll hand back to Fernanda and on to the next speaker. So thank you. Thank you so much, Louisa. And thank you for being here today. So our next speaker, I'll keep us move, moving as fast. Um, our next speaker is Carrie Whiteside and Carrie works for Fauna and Flora International, a global biodiversity conservation charity, which takes a strong focus on community capacity building for conservation and partnership working. For the past six years, Carrie has been delivering FFI's marine community support work in Scotland, which was established for a partnership between FFI and the community of Aran Seabed Trust. She provides support to a large number of coastal communities in Scotland, including those that are now part of the Coastal Communities Network. So I'll hand it over to Kerry now. Thank you, Fernanda. I've got some slides that I'm going to share. Can everybody see that? <clears throat> oh. Yeah, we could see it, Kerry. Okay. Oh, great. That's great, yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you for the introduction, Fernanda, and the opportunity to be here today to talk briefly about the Coastal Communities Network in Scotland. Um, so FFI has been supporting coastal communities who are interested in conservation in Scotland for about six years. As you say, we designed this project with the Community of Arran Seabed Trust. You're basically a group of local people from the Isle of Arran. They have achieved a huge amount in protecting their own local waters and they wanted to share their experience with others and help to create a movement of coastal communities who could really push for environmental protection in our seas. So back in 2014 there was no real community infrastructure to really bring all the individuals and community groups who were clearly out there together um, and by FFI providing direct advice and support to groups and through sharing their experiences and knowledge from across the coast, we started to build local capacity for marine conservation, but to also gauge appetite for a nascent community network. So when we, we, we worked with a host of individuals and groups and partners to actually build this infrastructure from the ground up, 
and uh, build what has become the Coastal Communities Network. So when we started in 2014, we were working with a small handful of groups. And today we're working with 17 different community groups across Scotland, which is very exciting. As you can see from the map here, CCN is a place-based network, which brings together geographically defined local communities who are working on a host of different marine conservation agendas. CCN um, is not a statutory organization, it's a voluntary space. And I guess um, the whole sort of raison d'etre behind CCN is really that it's very clear, and we've seen that through the example of Coast, that communities taking a stand alone can bring about change in their own local area. But to provide alternative viewpoints in the wider debate around marine management, it's really important for communities to come together under a joint banner and, divide, and develop a united voice if they want to. Um, and really, we have found in Scotland that there are a lot of issues that local groups do want to come together on and collaboration within the network is really crucial because the kinds of issues that these community groups are tackling are huge. You know, illegal fishing in marine protected areas, scallop dredging in the inshore, environmental impacts of salmon farming, and threats that we couldn't have even really predicted like industrial scale kelp dredging. So having a place where conservation voices within local communities can come together um, to have a stronger voice or even just to share morale is incredibly important. Um, in terms of the impacts that we're seeing from this collaboration of the Coastal Communities Network, we're seeing things like regional initiatives take off, like the Argyll Coast and Islands Hope Spot, which you heard about in a previous webinar. Um, the Hope Spot is all about promoting and capitalizing on the local marine protected area designations of the Argyll Coast and ensuring that real protection is upheld within them. And it's been really fantastic to see Coastal Communities Network groups come together in that area to build this Hope Spot. There's so much linked to, to the Hope Spot that I wish I had time to share with you today, but check out um, the really exciting new project Sea Wilding about native oyster restoration. And that's a project that was set up by one of CCN's, the Coastal Community Network's founding groups, CROMAC. Um, another really uh, collaborative project, which was born from the network, is one which we've been working with Nature Scott on. So that's formerly Scottish Natural Heritage, the advisors to Scottish government on nature conservation. And this is all focused on community-led marine biodiversity monitoring. So it's all about collecting data at sea and helping communities to share skills, knowledge, equipment techniques, protocols, all with a view to actually influencing management decisions um, in the government. And we, we feel that we've actually seen a fundamental shift in Nature Scott's approach to how they collect data and how they support coastal communities to collect data. Um, one of the big impacts that a lot of the coastal community groups are fighting for is policy change in Scotland, um, whether that's with regards to salmon farming or inshore fishing impacts. And I guess I would say with regards to that, that we still have mountains to climb here in Scotland in ensuring that our marine policies and management are fit for purpose. Um, but CCN, the groups within CCN are part of um, really important coalitions at the minute, like the Our Seas Coalition, which is pushing for critical inshore fisheries reform. And I guess the great thing in Scotland is that there are these campaigns and coalitions that are really active and fruitful um, that groups can tap into. And I think the more kind of local communities that tap into these initiatives, the better. Um, I wanted to just end, I guess, on thinking about what's ahead for the Coastal Communities Network. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I suppose our aspirations for the next year are to continue doing much of the same of what we're doing. Um, you know, building the Coastal Communities Network, building the mechanisms, the support mechanisms within that. But I also feel that um, what we also really want to do is just to be back together again and um, to get through the kind of tough times that we're all living through right now and to start to actually physically um, reunite because we're missing that a lot, of course. Um, and I'll just leave it there because I've got five minutes and I hope that was within the five minutes. That was great, Carrie. Thank you so much. So.
I am going to um, introduce our next speaker, um, who's Nicola Radford. Um, Nicola is a senior regeneration officer for Lincolnshire County Council, but she is also the executive secretary of the Coastal Communities Alliance, a partnership of mainly local authorities, which was formed to raise the profile of the socioeconomic challenges facing coastal communities. Nicola spends about 50% of her role on coastal matters. The remain remainder of her time, she spends coordinating the Greater Lincolnshire Local Enterprise Partnership Visitor Economy Board, advising rural and coastal businesses on attracting grants and overseeing the development of a network of technology hubs, which help businesses adapt to digital, digital technology. So um, Nicola, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, so yes, the Coastal Communities Alliance. Um, since 2007, the Coastal Communities Alliance has brought together coastal authorities and partners from around England to share a joint voice for social and economic issues that are unique to coastal areas with the underlying theme that a collective voice is more influential than individuals. It's a free to join partnership and we have over 200 members and have the pleasure to host over 100 coastal community teams virtually on our website and also support the Coastal Cultural Network which was funded initially through the Arts Council. From peripherality, seasonality and deprivation, the Alliance has worked together to lobby the government and influence policy and to secure coastal specific funding addressing key problems that have been preventing coastal areas from being able to thrive. We refreshed our policy statement in 2018 and this led to us giving both written and oral evidence at the recent House of Lords Select Committee into the regeneration of seaside towns. I think it's vital that coastal authorities work together to share their unique characteristics and solutions and to become more sustainable. And this was key in the launch of the Coastal Communities Fund that came out of the Select Committee inquiry. Although our key challenge is that not all coastal communities, like all communities, they're not the same. They're all unique and recognition is needed that whilst peripherality is an issue, there are many solutions and they're vastly different. So we can't just class coast as one unique um, entity. The, key, the CCA has been, in, in, has been key in influencing government. The one collective voice of local authorities is more powerful than an individual message. And this was instrumental in the initial House of Commons Select Committee in 2010 into coastal communities, which led to the Coastal Communities Fund and the Cross-Departmental Working Group for Coasts. This needs to be refocused and reinstalled along with a specific coastal minister to ensure that the coast is recognised and debated like urban and rural policy and legislation within government. There are three major coastal partnerships currently in England, the Coastal Partnerships Network, the Coastal Communities Alliance and the Local Government Coastal Special Interest Group. In 2017, we started to talk together about what a joined up approach to coastal working might look like. We discussed how we could share knowledge, support each other's work by aligning messages and supporting strategies. And you'll hear from Emily and Amy shortly. And we decided to collaborate on an annual national conference to bring together members and audiences together to enable a truly integrated approach to solving issues that shared across coastal communities throughout England. This has led to us being asked as a triumvirate to provide the secretariat for the all party parliamentary group into coasts being led by Mike Hill, the MP for Sunderland. We're currently looking at the criteria and the evidence base that we want to bring this together. So you'll be hearing more about this in the next few months. We also work very closely with the National Coastal Tourism Academy and NEF, and we've been developing a year of the English coast. And whilst this was paused for 2020, obviously due to COVID, we're looking to reinstate this into a three-year programme going forward from 2021. The next steps for the Coastal Communities Alliance is to continue to collaborate with partners through the APPG and to ensure that we provide enough evidence, support and solutions to coastal communities through our one voice and our one coastal approach. And I think this is very important when we're talking about the collaboration side of things and how working together with the same message, even though solutions may be different, is key to re raising the coast up the, the national agenda and into government. So I'll leave it there and let um, Amy and Emily talk a little bit wider about our collaboration. But I think that covers my five minutes. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you so much, Nicola. And apologies again to all speakers for <laughs> asking them to do such a hard um, you know, quick job um, when there's so much to talk about. Um, 
So yes, you will hear from Amy and Emily shortly, but just before um, uh, we hear from them, next, um, I want to introduce a, a great duo of speakers. Um, Professor uh, Sheena Stana is the director of the Plymouth Institute of Health and Care Research. Um, she's an interdisciplinary researcher with particular expertise in the formula funding of public services, health inequalities and health care equity. Through her work, Sheena developed a concern that the needs of coastal communities were being systematically under-resourced across a range of public services. So she explores this issue in depth in her forthcoming book, The Postcode Lottery in English Public Services, The Role of Formula Funding. And with her is Professor Sheila Agarwal, in, who is currently Associate Head of School of Research and Innovation for Plymouth Business School. She has a wealth of expertise in socioeconomic issues associated with seaside towns, including multiple deprivation and inequality. In addition, she has also been developing interest in climate change and adaptation and mitigation strategies, plastic pollution, disability, and in disaster and crisis management, focusing in particular on security risk management and resilience. So I will hand it over to Sheena and Sheila. Hi everybody, can you hear me and see the screen? I don't know where she, Sheila, are you there? Yes, I'm here, yes we can. Um, we're, we're literally gonna do a very quick overview of something that is currently in proposal stage. It's been um, submitted to the ESRC. Um, what we are asking for is funding for quite a, a large amount of money um, and what I really wanted to talk to you about, uh, so whether we, you know, we, we may not get this, but I really, really hope we do because I think there's a desperate need to start pulling together evidence and sharing that evidence, etc. across the coastal community. Um, so, uh, hang on, let me just reduce that down. Um, I think that you're all aware of the issues facing coastal communities and from our point of view there was uh, I think a, a real concern that if you look at for example health outcome measures, public health outcome measures, social care use etc, there really is a peripheral pattern developing and I'm not sure that that is appreciated across all of the government sectors. Um, so what we propose to do is do a number of foundation projects, sorry for racing through this like this, but this top one is quite important. Nicholas mentioned the fact that there are a load of different coasts, but perhaps a need for one coastal voice. One of the real difficulties we have in um, actually analysing coastal deprivation or coastal inequalities in service provision is the lack of a coastal definition. Um, so once you, we can map things out at LSO A level and see clear patterns, but doing that analysis is really, really tricky. So the first underpinning project would be a new coastal definition with the ONS, which I think would be so helpful to you know authorities and um, third sector organisations at all different levels. The second, once we have that definition, would be a large living in coastal community survey or two surveys, one focusing on adults and another on children. I think poor, poor educational attainment and poor public health outcomes for children are really, really becoming a quite concern. And I think these are issues that we need to get more information about. Um, the Coastal Observatory would then be a repository of data that you guys can use um, and we could support with analysis if you required that. Um, but I think, again, it's the data. I mean, I think Nicola's group does an amazing job in providing data, but it's often data which is sort of picked. It has to be picked sort of slightly unsystematically. And I think there's a need for this. And finally, um, an underpinning project to look at the determinants of economic performance and of, of coastal communities. Now, this is a, se a session about collaboration, and the next uh, part of the, uh, the programme would be to, to start building on those networks to make sure that the research that we do in collaboration with you is relevant and user informed. So there are two elements of this. The first is co-production by locating researchers in residence, um, usually in district town councils or local authorities, so that they can actually co-produce research projects that are of relevance to those um, to those areas. We'd also have a network of these researcher in residence, and it may be possible that different areas would want to look at similar things. Um, we'd then be building up, uh, and uh, we're sort of standing on the shoulders here, and I don't know, it might be better to actually build on the existing coastal alliance, but we effectively need a policy and, um, and 
public network to start to bring in the different sectors that are involved. Um, then informed by that, we would do a number of collaborative projects. Now, because we want these to be user informed, we're not too sure what, what these will be in the end, but these are the types of areas where we have expertise and our, our collaborators have expertise. And I think they're all important areas for coastal communities. Um, and, and this is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to, 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 to mobilize evidence-based approaches to bring people together and then start to really provide a more a, a, a kind of powerful resource, resource for, for changing those policy messages because it, I, I, I have to say I think despite the progress that's been done recently there's still a long way to go um, in persuading those different departments that, uh, that, that coastal is an issue. Sheila did you want to say anything on top of that? Um, just that we're waiting to hear back whether we're, we've got through this uh, first stage but if we are unsuccessful, it's highly, highly competitive. Um, but if we are unsuccessful, then the university is committed to um, making this happen anyway. So we will be taking it forward um, in some shape. It, it, might, it won't be as big as what it is now, but uh, certainly, you know, we'll, we'll be pushing this agenda forward. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, both Sheena and Sheila. Um, I think this was really important just to put that across that those things are in motion and um, there are efforts to, to make this happen. Um, again, I would encourage people, once we put them up on the website to, to watch the webinar from yesterday, um, where we heard a lot of you know, the people that are doing research and analysis on, on um, uh, the socioeconomics, environmental and, and cultural and political challenges of coastal communities. And this is much needed work. Um, that we need to see happening. Um, so I will introduce our next speaker now, um, Amy Pryor. Um, she's a marine and steering scientist with over 20 years of experience in the field of marine and coastal management. She is the technical director at the Thames Estuary Partnership, London's coastal partnership covering the tidal Thames. Um, she's responsible for developing and managing a robust program of projects and research that cuts across themes and agendas. Amy is also the chair of the UK Coastal Partnerships Network, which exists to facilitate knowledge exchange and sharing best practice across nearly 100 similar organizations and provides a national voice for local issues, championing an integrated approach across our estuaries and coasts, land and water. So I will hand it over to Amy now. Thank you, Fernanda, and sorry, the, the bio is quite so long. Um, <clears throat> Fernanda has asked me to talk about the Coastal Partnership Network, but also to, um, to put in some of my personal experience and personal views. So I'm going to try to do that as concisely as possible. Um, the Coastal Partnership Network, as you've just heard, uh, it was established back in 2006 as actually a working group. Um, and coastal partnerships have actually existed since the late 80s. Um, weathering the storms of changes in government and austerity, diversifying their approaches, but ultimately um, they exist born out of a local need by groups of people that really wanted to make a change across their local coastal space or their lo local estuary. And the way that they uh, try to achieve this is by integrating across across sectors and across agendas to bring a more joined up approach to management of the coast. And the way we define coast within coastal partnerships is uh, it's not that narrow strip between the high and the low tide. It, the land influences the water and the water influences the land and everything that happens in between needs to be managed in a much more joined up way. But when you look at policy and when you look at management uh, mechanisms, they tend to be very much done in silos from central government level right down to local level, not making or joining the dots between all of these different issues. And that's one of the biggest challenges I think that we have at the coast is where when you're a, when you're a, a small organization or a charity or a community group trying to do good things at the coast, trying to access the funding streams that will bring you a project that will give multiple benefits to people and environment is really tricky because most funding streams tend to only recognize hard metrics as in you know what kind of change physical change are you going to make at the, at the coast or how many people are you going to influence and for example you can have what 
we need to realize that actually by a healthy environment or enabling a healthy environment is an economic project, is a social project. They are intrinsically linked, just like uh, all of our previous speakers have said. And at the moment that is not recognized in the way that funding streams are administered and uh, the way the policy is created. So that's what coastal partnerships are really all about. They're trying to work across a coastal space and really join the dots between uh, social, economic and environmental issues. So um, what's changed in the last five years is I became involved with the Coastal Partnership Network back in 2014. So they've been, the network itself had been around for a very long time before I came along. Um, and I, uh, our then di technical director, uh, our then director retired and I jumped at the chance uh, to join this network because I recognized that this was a passionate community. These were people that voluntarily picked up the phone and shared their knowledge with each other. They put their hands in the pockets and came together once a year without any financial support and tiny, tiny budgets to come together in a coastal space to share what they've been doing, share what their issues and their challenges were. So I really wanted to see uh, what was going on around the rest of the country. What lessons could I learn to bring to the Thames and what lessons could I potentially impart? So I threw myself in at the deep end and became the secretary uh, and uh, spent about two years learning from the then chair, uh, Niall Benson, who's on the participants list today, um, learning how to have these collaborative conversations. Who did I need to speak to and how was it relevant uh, for the Thames? And then a couple of years later, I was elected as chair. And since then, I've taken the action plan that they've, uh, that they've been working on year on year since 2006 and tried to really join it across all these different opportunities. But I think the biggest change I've noticed since my time in the Coastal Partnership Network is that there is a coastal movement. The coastal, all of these different voices started to talk about issues through different lenses, but then they started to find each other, either through the Blue New Deal or through the Coastal Partnership Network. Neil Benson, it was Neil Benson's idea to, to bring the Coastal Communities Alliance and the local government coastal special interest group together, because we all come at the coastal issues from these different approaches and different lenses. And by joining together as one coastal voice, we can shout louder and we can be heard above uh, the cacophony of all the different issues in our society today. So um, I think threw my, all of my passion into it. And uh, in the last couple of years, we've been uh, really fortunate to be able to put our case across because quite frankly, talking about the interconnectivity and the complexity of not only the social issues, but the environmental issues at the coast is really difficult. And in order to have those conversations, you need people. You need people who understand it, people who are passionate, people who are gonna really strive to make that change. Um, and a lot of funding doesn't like to support people. They like to support physical outputs. Uh, so I've, I'm really proud of all of the coastal partnerships around the country that have survived over 30 years to keep doing what they're doing and keep striving. The next steps for us is we're professionalizing the network. So we're moving from a volunteer run base to a legal entity so that we can do more. We can attract funding into the structure of the network itself. Skills is absolutely a key thing for coastal partnerships. A standard coastal partnership officer needs to know quite a lot, quite in-depth knowledge across multiple subjects and be able to join the dots and have those conversations with lots of different types of uh, sectors in a meaningful way to bring it all together so that we can create those integrated projects that will bring big multiple benefits for people and environment. So we're professionalizing We'll have a strategy in place by the end of January next year. And um, with, uh, we're looking to develop a learning and development program that really brings to life those skills that you have within a coastal partnership and to try and provide a career pathway because we lose good people all the time due to that uncertainty of funding and uncertainty of the external world. So we want to make that more sustainable um, and more, more of a long-term attractive offer. We also need to diversify. We need a much broader range of coastal voices that truly represent the, uh, the makeup of any coastal community. But we also need to not, uh, not forget that a local coastal space has its local issues and its local needs. You need to retain that local identity, but provide a national framework that really supports 
uh, that national knowledge exchange, replication of approaches, diversification of voices, but really holds, uh, holds and supports that, that local identity. So I think I'm going to uh, leave it there because um, so I'm going to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'm just, thank you so much. Like that, that was um, really great and so important to hear. Like, I think it's really important not to just talk about, you know, how, um, you know, what things look like, but like how the details of like how actually all these things take time and you know the, the challenges that it is actually to to bring people together and to keep the energy levels of people you know and the passion Absolutely. alive you know yeah. considering all those challenges so thank you so much amy and yes i'm moving us swiftly just so we can have enough time to hear from everyone so thank you to, um to all the speakers um that have uh showcase the range of ways in which collaboration is happening on the coast. This year, there has been a lot of focus on COVID and the health crisis um, that it has unleashed, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, we are also facing the challenges of mass unemployment and economic recession, and yet uncertain impacts of Brexit. Um, but what about climate change and the vulner vulnerability of our coast to it? Um, don't think we can forget that. So um, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, um, we speak a, a little bit on this theme as well. Emily Cunningham is a marine um, and coastal specialist and is lead officer of the Local Government Association's Coastal Special Interest Group and an independent consultant. So handing it over to you, Emily. Thanks, Fernanda. Are you able to share the slides? Um, brilliant. I, I can see them hoping everybody else can. Um, thanks, Fernanda. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here today to hear about all the inspiring and innovation, innovative collaboration happening at the coast. Um, I'm the lead officer of the Local Government Association's Coastal Special Interest Group. We have a membership of 57 local authorities from all around England, and together we cover about 60% of England's coast. Today, I'm going to be talking about climate change and adaptation. You go on to the next slide, please, Fernanda. For me, I can only see the whole screen. I'm not sure if what other oh. people can see. I, can someone, maybe one of the panelists, just tell me if they can see the second slide? Because I can. No. OK, sorry about that. Yeah, I can see that. Hopefully, everybody else can as well. So. Climate change, if we think back to this time last year, uh, the UK public's climate concern was at an all time high, second only to concerns about Brexit. Back then the British public showed significant concern about flooding and heat waves. And those of us that work on climate adaptation were gearing ourselves up to make the 2020 super year for the environment count. And then COVID-19 happened. And the pandemic has dominated our work days and news feeds over the recent months. And climate change has in part fallen off the top of the agenda. In local government, other pressing needs took over our time, keeping people safe as well and well, ensuring essential services were delivered, and like everyone else, looking forward to the pandemic being over. But of course, the climate crisis hasn't gone away. Could you go to the next slide, please? So our coast is dynamic. In some places, it naturally erodes and floods, but climate change is accelerating these processes and the risk of coastal flooding and erosion are increasing. According to the 2018 UK climate change projections, average sea level could increase by over a metre by the end of the century. So coastal communities, those same communities that are facing the myriad of socioeconomic challenges we've heard about in this webinar series, they're at the sharp end of the climate crisis. And this is affecting communities right now. In preparing this talk, I pulled out maps of coastal erosion risk, found those often used statistics about the number of houses that are at risk of permanent coastal erosion or permanent inundation. But I think the only way for us to think about this issue is to remember that those houses on the cliff edge are somebody's home, perhaps the only home they've ever known or the place where they've poured their life savings in the hope of a happy life or a happy retirement. That collection of houses behind the coastal defence is a community and behind that business at risk of permanent inundation is a lot of hard work and sacrifice. These are lives, livelihoods and identities that are being consumed by the sea. And at present, property losses are being borne by the property owner. There is no right to protection or compensation 
Losing your home or business is truly awful, and thanks to climate change, this is only going to get worse. Now, traditionally, our approach has been to mitigate the risks of flooding and coastal erosion by building sea defences and trying to engineer our way to safety. We now know that this approach is no longer universally viable, and instead we're transitioning slowly uh, to building community resilience to flooding and coastal change. Many communities around our coast are unaware of the risk that they face and that in some places the loss of land or permanent inundation is unavoidable. So a lot has been learned since the original National Flood and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy for England was published in 2011 and we used a lot of those hard lessons to feed into the new national strategy which was published this summer. The new strategy covers the period 2021 to 2027, a critical time for building climate resilience and starting in the new super year for the environment, we hope. This strategy speaks a good game. It heralds itself as an opportunity to create climate resilient places that facilitate a greener, cleaner and more resilient future. We particularly welcome the explicit incorporation of coastal adaptation into the strategy. We know that well-planned early adaptation uh, saves, uh, saves money and lives. But as with everything, the devil will be in the detail and local authorities are working closely with the Environment Agency and DEFRA to ensure that that is what we can collectively deliver. If you go on to the next slide, please. So adaptation, what do we mean by adaptation? But it's typically viewed as actions in response to climate change that seek to limit its impact and or bring some benefit to human society. So in reality, this could mean a wide spectrum of activities from innovative building design to having to relocate infrastructure or people, or it could be changing land use or livelihoods. At present, the narrative around adaptation is focused on loss. We are working to help people who will lose their homes, their business, their community. And to do so, we as coastal local authorities, we need further tools. And after a decade of austerity, we need additional funding to develop and then implement these tools. At present, there is no established, established financing or funding mechanism available to aid or incentivize residents to relocate from high risk erosion or permanent inundation areas. The new national strategy prioritizes engagement. We agree wholeheartedly that long-term regular engagement with our at most at-risk residents is absolutely key, but we need funding to train our staff and to actually deliver it. Losing your home is something I wish none of our residents had to face. It brings with it unimaginable stress and grief. And at present, the evidence base around the mental health impacts of coastal change and loss is lacking. And we're working to resolve this so we can better incorporate it into our ad adaptation work. But done sensitively and well, there are opportunities around coastal adaptation. And this is again where that engagement capacity comes in. What do coastal communities want to see at their coast once they accept that we can no longer prevent coastal loss? By letting natural processes resume, coastal habitats could flourish. Some of those same habitats that sequester carbon and help mitigate climate change. Those same habitats that could be nursery habitats for the species that support the local fishing industry and are food for the wildlife that could bring in out of season tourists creating new jobs, changing how we treat our coast and making green and wild spaces, all the benefits they bring to a wider range of people. Could a happier future follow this tragedy? Do you go on to the next slide, please? So coastal adaptation is a strategic priority for the LGA Coastal SIG. We've recently brought together a national adaptation working group to innovate solutions in the areas of community engagement, planning, funding, policy, and technical solutions. This is being led by the brilliant Karen Thomas at Coastal Partnership East and brings together officers from across England. This group of expert practitioners is working closely with the Environment Agency on the relevant measures for the action plan through which the new National Flooding and Coastal Erosion Risk Management Strategy, or FCRM, will be delivered. We recognise that these issues are not unique to England, so we're also bringing together a four country working group with practitioners from Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So please do get in touch if this is of interest. We support and sit on the steering group of the Coastal Loss and Innovative Finance Project, or CLIF, which seeks to investigate and assess potential funding and financing solutions to assist and incentivize residents at high risk areas to relocate. So as you can see, continuing with the theme of today's webinar, collaboration is absolutely key. So I'll finish now on what needs to happen next. And our five headline asks, we need clear national policy on coastal adaptation, alignment of that policy ambition with funding provision, the reinstatement of the cross-government working group on coast, improved cross-sectoral working across the coastal marine space, expanding who we talk to and who we work with, and appointment of a dedicated minister for coastal communities. Please get in touch if you would like to collaborate or have any questions. I'm Emily Duckingham at South Tyneside. Thank you all for listening.
Thank you so much, Emily. Um, that is such an important topic, again, that I wish we had more time um, to go into. Um, but I will move us on to the next speaker. Um, you've heard from Emily and that's, that covers a lot. So um, the next speaker is Dr. Angina. I might not be pronouncing it right, Katwa. Um, but I am really, really excited to have her here today because I think there's a, an important thing that has been this discussed, it, it, it's in discussion, you know, through, through the coastal movement and through the wider kind of social um, uh, movement around the world, really, about, you know, the need, the, the, the inequalities, really, um, that, that we live with, the structural inequalities that we live with in society, and how different things affect different people differently, um, depending on, you know, your, your race or your gender or um, where you come from. Um, so, um, I wanted to bring in um, Dr. Katwa because um, she, um, you know, has, has spoken quite a lot about that from a personal experience. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a lot more research is needed um, on this, but also just a lot more discussion is needed on this. So I'll, I won't say any more, I'll let her speak. Um, she's an earth scientist um, as a learning specialist for 15 years. She has developed an award-winning education program for the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site. And Angina is a finalist in the National Diversity Awards 2020 as a positive role model for race, faith, and religion for championing diversity in her field. She currently works for Wessex Museums and the Wessex Engagement Lead um, to develop systems and frameworks to engage new and underserved audiences with museum spaces. She holds various board positions at museums, philanthropic charities, learned societies, and is the vice chair of the Dorset Race Equality Council. So I'll hand it over to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fernanda. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, good. Yep. Excellent. Uh, I have been working, I mean, I've been working in the environmental sector and natural heritage sector for over 20 years. And one of the key things that I've noticed um, is that I am pretty much the only brown face in the room. And we are talking a career spanning uh, 20 years, not just in the UK, but also in the US and in different countries as well. Why is that? I really want to explore that with you today, because I think this really is an important consideration when you start thinking about the communities that live on the coast, the communities that want to visit the coast, and particularly your workforce that looks after these special places. I've had a very long career working on the Jurassic Coast. Uh, it's a phenomenal place, one of the most, probably one of the most famous coastlines in, in Great Britain because it's a World Heritage Site as well. But being in this space, being in a predominantly rural white space brings all sorts of challenges for people of colour. Um, when you look at the statistics, uh, there was a report done in 2017, and actually 0.6% of the workforce in the environmental sector identify as black or Asian. Now just imagine how that feels for someone like me, when you walk into meetings, when you go into an office every day, when you are engaging in conferences, when you are generally doing your day-to-day -day work, that is an incredible burden to carry. And what that means is that you are isolated, you can experience hostility um, within those spaces as a consumer of the natural environment, but also as somebody within those uh, workplaces themselves. What that tends to do to you after a while is it really affects you. I've been living in Dorset now for almost 16 years. And, and what it does is it really impacts on your sense of identity and your sense of belonging. Now, I've been coming to coastlines for as long as I can remember. This is a picture from probably when I was about 10 years old. You can see me as the little girl wearing the Mickey Mouse t-shirt in the corner. This is the Isle of Wight. You probably recognize the geology. It's Allen Bay. When my family went there in the 19, uh, kind of the early 1980s, we were looked at, we were stared at. People made comments, you know, why are they here? We, I actually grew up in Slough. So going to the coastline was an amazing treat for my family. But when we arrived, we were made to not feel welcome. And a good example of this, one of my earliest memories of racism was kind of me and my brother and my sister playing in a small paddling pool. 
and white families pulling their children out of that paddling pool and then us children wondering why that was and these are real experiences that I had and then we come on to like just getting our picnic out on a beach you know and eating our traditional Indian food and people would walk past and make comments about the awful smell and clothes that my the traditional clothes that my family would wear so you can see my grandmother in this picture wearing her sari you know it's perfectly acceptable to wear whatever you like in whatever landscape you want to visit but particularly for black and asian communities we are made to feel like we don't belong because we don't fit the 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 kind of the image of somebody that is in the outdoors or is on a beach and there's all sorts of cultural factors as to why you won't see black and asian people parading up and down a beach in a bikini it might be cultural it might be religious but you know to, to not have that acceptance there in the community around you was an extremely hard place to be. So what can organizations do to start to tackle this kind of perception uh, that black and Asian people aren't welcome in these spaces? Um, there is a huge issue within the workforce itself when we are talking about a, a figure of visible minority ethnic people of 0.6%, it creates an image that people coming to these spaces see. This is a white space. It's represented by the front of house all the way through to the ranges that you might see out on the coast. What you need to do within these organizations is embed a culture of inclusion, equity, and diversity from the very, very top. And I do this a lot now. Over the last year, I've worked with a huge number of charities, organizations, and companies, training boards of trustees and training um, senior leadership in how to embed that culture of inclusion within their organizations. So when you are welcoming people to these spaces, they know exactly what to say, how to behave and pass that on to their staff teams. When you are looking at community engagement, you need to work in partnership with those diverse communities. So you need to go into those spaces where those diverse communities are and bring those officers, those teams into your funding bids. Do not develop projects for them develop projects with them. I think the other thing, because this is only a five minute talk, the other thing that I see happen over and over again, and I pulled up, um, who was it, Natural England on this last week on Twitter, was there is not enough representation of black and Asian faces within the marketing, within your campaigns. And there are plenty of excellent role models out there on social media that will help you to do that job. Black Girls Hike is a fantastic, group out there that are championing black faces in the natural environment you need to do you need to work harder as organizations to connect with those influencers and you need to do more to bring those voices in because through that you will start to see changes happen thank you so much thank you so much um that's really great and i, I think i mean i <laughs> i think this is extremely important and i really wish um we could we could have a discussion just on you know inclusivity and and making sure that we have um, that everyone feels welcomed basically um, on our coastline. Um, obviously, we know that there are deeper uh, rooted problems uh, around that, and you know again my fault um, that and then I could could not go into more details about this. Um, but please reach out to her um, and. Uh, follow the work and, and join and please take the advice and, and the recommendations as well um, into your work. So I'm going to move us on um, now to our next speaker. So last year was a really important year for climate activism with many manifestations by youth strikers all over the world demanding government action um, on, on climate issues and the birth of a diverse movement for a Green New Deal in the UK. This collective organizing of people all over the country meant that as the pandemic hit, there was a strong foundation for this movement to come together and create the Build Back Better campaign, which government um, seems to also be using those words. Um, and we, we need to see um, something done in reality that really delivers on that, on, on that vision. So given the context for coastal communities in the UK, hosting some of the most deprived areas in the country, oh, most vulnerable to the economic impact of lockdowns, and to the impacts of climate change, I think there's still more work to be done to bring the climate and the coastal movement together. Um, and that's why I'm delighted that we have the next two speakers, um, great examples of how people in the coastal areas are working towards building our strength in numbers to get the changes we need and to make them happen. 
So firstly, I will introduce Maggie Brown. Maggie um, is an international development professional and social policy analyst who spent most of her career working with NGOs and UN agencies, mainly in Angola and Southern Africa. Um, she is aware that many of, of um, uh, the, the, the climate impacts around the world were caused um, in, 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 in um, last developed, the last developed countries around the world um, were caused by climate change. Since retiring in 2018, she has become an activist for the Green New Deal in the UK. From late 2019, um, she has been focusing on developing a Green New Deal hub in Great Yarmouth, Norfolk, where she was born and brought up. So I will we'll hand it over to Maggie now. Thank you very much, Fernanda. Um, and thanks to all the previous speakers. I'm learning an awful lot being on this webinar. <clears throat> Fernanda's asked me to start with why I became involved in the Green New Deal. And I would say there were two principal reasons. First, um, I was extremely worried about the results of the December 19 uh, election and felt that we had possibly lost some of the momentum towards the green industrial revolution. Um, and I was worried that climate change was way too big and too urgent to be left for the next opportunity to, to make a kind of shift in thinking. Secondly, because why Great Yarmouth? Uh, because I was born and brought up here, as Fernanda said. And when I was a child, I can still remember the tail end of the fishing industry when Yarmouth still had a strong sense of community and pride through that. But it was already fading during my childhood in the 1960s. And by then, I think Yarmouth gradually over the years lost its sense of purpose and kind of drifted and became more and more resentful of immigration, of feeling left out and ignored. And I think a good example of that is that fully 71% of the population voted for Brexit. It was the fifth highest Brexit vote in the UK. And the town had a UKIP mayor in 2016. Um, health and education indicators are lower than the national average and lower than Norfolk County as a whole. And in general, there was a shift towards the right, which makes any kind of movement, um, or in, in this context, in the context of the Green New Deal, looking at climate change and the nexus for jobs and, um, and job opportunities, unemployment, um, it, it makes all of that movement much more difficult to establish. Uh, and certainly it makes it more difficult to promote discussions about inequality, which was kind of seen as lefty, inappropriate, out of step in the context of, of the Yarmouth way of thinking. My view was that Yarmouth now has a huge opportunity uh, to regain its purpose and, and a sense of identity as a kind of green town of getting local people into jobs, particularly in offshore wind energy, but not only that, many other aspects of green industry. But that was not happening, or I would say is still not happening in a kind of consistent and strategic way. So I wanted to set up the Great Yarmouth Green New Deal hub. And I started by contacting various organizations parties, political parties, faith-based groups, trade unions, et cetera, and, and others. Um, and I found one excellent colleague uh, through that, but the two of us didn't get much further. Um, we organized a number of meetings, there were discussions, nobody really wanted to take it any further. And we felt that there was a very kind of strong sense of demoralization um, amongst people who are activists or that key activists are so overwhelmed with what they're trying to do they really don't have space to take on anything else or anything that's seen as new so my colleague and i kind of shifted tack and decided to take on a different approach that's brought us in touch fortunately with another two very committed activists and we're hoping that we expand from here and the shift in approach that we've taken is to focus on climate education and taking it out 
to people and starting with young people uh, working through the Youth Advisory Board. And we'll have our first session very soon that will cover uh, broadly kind of climate science, what can be done to reduce carbon footprints, and also what opportunities there are and could be um, in Great Yarmouth for green jobs and skills. Um, and then we hope that youth organisations will kind of take it from there and they are going to organise a climate conference and try to bring in other young people and, and use uh, what we've discussed um, as a basis for, for working with others and to try and to think through solutions. So we hope in that way to generate a movement that we'll be able to work in, in together with the local council to create kind of win-wins for, for local people uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of training, but also in terms of reducing carbon footprints. So we're looking at promoting kind of apprenticeships, uh, tech college training in offshore wind energy insulation, fitting air source heat pumps, the kind of jobs that will come out of um, green industry if it's possible to get more state investment in those areas promoting natural drainage tree planting peatland restoration restoring footpaths etc and then maybe later also look at some of the issues that have been raised here today in this webinar on coastal erosion sea level rising and planning for adaptation um, we hope to also go into schools to do this work and eventually to work with residents associations, especially in the most deprived areas of town. And I've taken on a kind of volunteer role with the local enterprise partnership because it, give, it will give me access to industry, um, including offshore wind, but also building um, and many others. Um, it will give me access to industry, to schools and to the local council. And then we can try and join those dots as other people have referred to, um, to try and promote kind of locally driven change. And I was fascinated to read the report on turning back to the sea. And if we manage to develop momentum through this work, we can begin to look more broadly at the kind of coastal alliances that have been discussed here and perhaps even opportunities through uh, fishing and aquaculture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maggie. Um, that's really great to hear, like in such detail as well, like about the journey um, to really build, um, um, you know, a, a movement around uh, things at a local level as well. Um, so I'm going to go straight to Dan. Um, Dan uh, Daniel Ward, um, he volunteers for Cardiff Green New Deal, part of the Green New Deal UK, um, which is a national campaign group with the aim of driving the move to a low carbon sustainable economy. Dan trained as an ecologist and now works as an independent advisor on sustainable systems and long-term thinking. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Fernando. Uh, let's share my screen. I've got a few slides. I hope everyone can see that. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, and uh, thanks, thanks, Maggie. Um, so, yeah, uh, Dan Ward, I'm here from Cardiff Green New Deal. Uh, so we're part of like Green New Deal, Green New Deal UK, uh, which is a national campaigning organization. So me and Maggie are both at like, regional hubs, uh, and uh, uh, but we're kind of coordinating nationally and so on. And just for those who don't know, uh, like just a brief thing about what a Green New Deal is, it's, uh, uh, it's about driving like a rapid change, a rapid transition to this low carbon sustainable econ economy and society where, um, but in a way that makes sure that we give, create, create thriving and prosperous societies and create well-paid jobs in, you know, in green industries and so on, and that restore our natural environment as well. And, uh, and then this is kind of like really what, you know, what attracted me to the Green New Deal uh, is that it's really solutions-based, it's about action. So it's, it's not about saying, oh, you know, putting blame about where we're at, uh, about how we've got here. It's about saying, okay, this is where we're at. Where do we want to go to? How do we get there? And you know, how can what can I what can I do? What can you do? Well, how can we work together to do that? And, you know, and a lot of other speakers have talked about the importance of collaboration so far today, and I, th I think I, I would totally second that. Um, so, a bit of context with Cardiff. Uh, now, Cardiff, we're a coastal city, uh, population about three hundred fifty thousand people, and growing, and. Um, 
Of course, uh, an interesting thing is that uh, there was a recently there was a recent study that found Cardiff came sixth out of eighty five cities uh, as being as in their vulnerability to climate change impacts. Uh, so, just for context, Amsterdam was third and London was twenty second. And so, for Cardiff, that's primarily sea level rise. And uh, the map you can see here with the with the, the red, that red is the projected area that's going to be below the annual annual flood level um, by twenty fifty. And that's in like an average emission scenario. And I can say actually that even if you put it, change that to the really low emission scenario, if we did rapid cut straight away, it's still not pretty. So, um, you know, cause we have locked in a certain amount of sea level rise. And of course this isn't just sea level rise, it's um, rainfall as well. So climate change, it's not sea level rise, it's, not, it's sea level rise, it's uh, more storms, more extreme weather events ac across the year. And for Britain, it's warmer, wetter winters is what we predicted. So here in Wales, we've had, a lot of flooding uh, over the last year. Uh, that the, the picture in the bottom left, that's right near the center of Cardiff. Uh, luckily in Cardiff, we have um, a big park there. So, uh, it, and it took the brunt of the flooding, which just shows the importance of those, having those green spaces, those nature-based solutions built, you know, and, pl and planning for, for, these, for these events really. Uh, but there's other, you know, Fairbourne and West Wales, uh, they're probably going to be, yeah, so it's not just Cardiff, Fairbourne and West Wales, they're probably going to be some of the first climate refugees in the UK. Uh, they've been told their flood fences won't be renewed past 2050. So, uh, you yeah, know, as, as previous speaker mentioned, you know, how do we ensure that those communities aren't left, left literally and metaphorically stranded? Um, uh, and yeah, and then it's up, upstream from Cardiff as well. Is that there's been like, lots of uh, communities flooded up, upstream in the valleys of Wales and so on. And you know, those coastal communities, they're the ones that are most at risk from these. There's this combination of um, uh, sea level rise and high rainfall. So, uh, what have we been doing here in Cardiff? Well, so we're, I'm a volunteer for, for Cardiff Green New Deal. We're all, there's about uh, seven of us active members. Um, Cardiff, uh, we, we, yeah, we're so, and this I think it's like that kind of place-based context. So here in Cardiff, the we've got a slightly different um, uh, legislative environment here. So there's, we already have a Wellbeing Future Generation, Generations Act in Wales, which we can hold councillors and politicians on account to. We've got the Welsh elections for the Welsh Parliament coming up in May next year. Uh, we have votes for 16 year olds here as well. So we can, uh, things of like engaging with those youth members. Uh, Cardiff has just announced recently, it's got uh, its uh, strategy for a net, net to be net zero by 2030. And so we've been uh, en uh, engaging with like councillors and uh, under assembly members, that's for the Welsh parliament, trying to, uh, I can encourage it, it big up their confidence really to act. I think I think confidence is a really a really key thing here because this is these are big changes that we're talking about, uh, but it's a huge opportunity as well as, as as people already mentioned. It's probably the biggest opportunity in the last century to to really transform our uh, our places and our environment for the better. You know, potentially uh, we. we you know, um, uh, just think you know things if we if we if everyone's got. Uh, well insulated houses and so on how much how much money that frees up to spend in the local economy on other things that could be little like, like independent businesses uh, if we restore our marine environment Maggie's fishing fleets in Great Yarmouth might be restored who knows um, and as well as all those other benefits like protecting us from erosion and sucking down carbon and so on um, so yeah, so that's what we're really focusing on the, the political end of things at the moment, helping Cardiff with their uh, feeding into their net zero strategy uh, and bringing groups together, you know, like, like looking at how, how can we be part of that collaboration. Um, and then look, we're putting a manifesto together for the elections next year. Um, oh, I just say uh, that map that if you look on there, that uh, www.coastalclimatecentral.org, there's, there's those, those they have those maps there, an interactive map for the entire UK, where you can look at uh, sea level rise and flooding impacts and under different mission scenarios and so on. And it's, it's really, it's really good, it's a really handy resource. Um, so I would say, um, the th you know, there's the thing, so we're all volunteers, we've got a real mix. We, I think, I think our, I don't know what our age range is 17 to, uh, I, don't, I don't know what your friend is. Um, and uh, my, my advice is uh, if, yeah, I think everyone can get involved, but let's 
focus on action. Let's focus on what we have in common. Let's not focus on what, what separates us. Like what, what can, what do we all, what, what do we want? What do we all, what are those commonalities? And let's, let's use those and make some positive steps. Um, and, and let's get moving really, because the longer we wait, uh, the bigger the negative impacts are going to be. And the, the later we're going to get those like huge positive opportunities. Um, so uh, yeah, we're um, if, if you're in Wales, we're the only Co-Hub Green New Deal hub in Wales at the moment. Uh, so we're Cardiff Green New Deal at gmail.com. And if you're in the wider UK, uh, there's uh, have a look at uh, email them uh, info Green New Deal Green New Deal Green New Deal UK org, or have a look at the website. And uh, th thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, and just to say that you know what I'd like to see is just. Um, lots of um, um, Green New Deal hubs and whatever you want to call but change, <laughs> you know, change hubs around um, our coast, bringing together, you know, um, people from different generations and, and from different backgrounds as much as possible. So um, great to hear that that's already ongoing, Cardiff and Great Yarmouth. Um, we don't have um, a lot of time left. Um, I obviously um, should have predicted that <laughs> as it goes, trying to fit so many different voices, but I hope everyone can appreciate that, you know, there are so many different voices out there and so many different perspectives and so many different issues that matter um, on the coast. Um, and, and, and I thought it was more important that you hear from, from all these amazing people and from, from all these amazing, uh, you know, regarding all these, these really important issues. Um, I'm gonna hand over to our final speaker who I'm delighted to, to have here is someone I've been um, in touch with and working with for the past few years. Um, Sasha um, Batting, he's the manager at the Wharton Trust Community Organization in Hartlepool. He's a member of the local trusts, big local coastal communities cluster. So we work together on that along with um, the other big local areas on the coast that joined. And he's also, um, I'll say this, but basically Sasha is like leading the wave around, you know, bringing coastal communities together. He um, encouraged locality as well to set up a coastal communities special group. He has been um, engaging with his local MP, Mike Hill, who now chairs the APPG for coastal communities. Um, Sasha is really like an amazing person um, that really inspired me. So I'm really happy to have him here today um, to speak and, and close our webinar. Um, with his message. Um, and Sasha, thank you so much for being here despite, you know, um, feeling um, not so well today. Sasha, yeah. I'll hand it over to you. Thank, thanks, Fernanda. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm a bit, I'm blushing. Uh, uh, we've got a, a COVID. Uh, we're isolating because we've all got COVID in my household and there's just two things which it does. It might mean I get interrupted, but secondly, my the one, the, the one thing that is feels really weird is my thoughts don't feel attached to my body. So if this goes off on one, just cut us off, Fernanda. Uh, as Fernanda said, uh, I've been looking at this for a couple of years. And actually, what's really odd is I was born in Blackpool. So I'm from Blackpool originally, and I now live in Hartlepool. And I never really thought about coast as a thing. It was just where I lived and the sea, you know, the metronomic of the sea came in and it went out. Uh, and actually, it was only when... Uh, local trusts got together with the big local partnerships and said, we're actually going to create a coastal communities cluster that I even dawned on me that there was something to do with coast. It never even entered my head particularly. Uh, and, and following that, it was a case of when we sat together, we thought, actually, it doesn't matter what we think because actually there's nowhere to take this particularly. So there's areas and uh, the big local areas are in, you know, some of the most disadvantaged communities in the country. And actually it doesn't matter what we think, there was nowhere to take it. So fortunately for me, Mike Hill is a, you know, a responsive MP and he has to see me as a constituent. So I asked him to do something about it. And to his credit, he created the APPG for coastal communities. Uh, and actually that work has enabled, obviously as local trusts go and develop other things, it's enabled us to work with locality, which is like a big national umbrella organization. So that those coastal, uh, organizations have been able to get together and start looking at stuff about how can we uh, how, how can how can we get together and do something to, to change it and so so I'm sorry if I speak on an England only basis it's just because of the way funding is and, and, and what I know so but obviously there is you know the coast of the United Kingdom uh, is relevant to all of us 
And I think what's been fascinating for me personally has been how, when we've looked up, uh, you know, COVID has shone a light on things in a way which I'm not sure we would otherwise have had a chance to do it. And it's wreaked havoc, but it's actually opened a door and opened a door for us that we need to really take responsibility for, for doing something about it. And that, that isn't just about the coast, that's about how do we, you know, have a, sh have a fundamental shift in the way the country operates. I, and really, I mean, anybody who lives by the coast, we know the joy to see. And we'll be really surprised when our coastal towns and villages were swamped by visitors the moment the travel restrictions were eased. And, you know, and at, in other parts of our lives, it would have been entirely welcome, but obviously we were, we were quite concerned about how that happened. But, you know, but collectively, we, when we've heard it all today, you know, we know that coastal towns, unemployment is scandalously high low pay, insecure work, lack of infrastructure, you know, policy work like bed and breakfast becoming houses of multiple occupation, our, our low education attainment, the way transient communities with no sense of place, second homeowners pricing out local people, making life a daily struggle. You know, and all of that stuff manifests itself in some of the highest death rates in the country. You know, this is, not, and they aren't relative terms, they're absolute. I live in a town where life expectancy for men has dropped one and a half years in the last five years. Yeah, and actually, if we don't do something about that, what does that actually mean? And we also know, like, and it's been said here today, that our coastal perspectives aren't reflected in policy, and they're certainly not invested in investment decisions. And as much as the coast, you know, the coastal fund was great, but it was peanuts when we think about seventeen billion pounds for crossrail and counting. Yeah, let's let's put this into some sort of context. And, and there was a bit of me, which was one of the meetings, I mean, it's always the case, is that we always have meetings in London, even though we're a coastal alliance. And that HSBC advert just, like, really, really, really annoyed me. It's like, we're not an island. Well, actually, we are. Yeah, we're more than an island, but we are an island. But our coastal voice is fragmented by the nature of geography, yeah. We're singular destinations, we're places to go to and not through. Yeah, and we're all 100-degree communities. But there's 10 million of us. There's 10 million of us live by our coast. And actually, if we all lived in one place, that would be the biggest city in the country by something, by some measure. And, and part of me thinks like we need to get organized and we need to leave the charge to coastal proof policy. You know, we need to build on the love of our coast to make sure the economic, te technological, environmental future works for us. I will guarantee that the first carbon negative community in this country is by the coast. Be why? Because we have the natural assets to make it so. Yeah, and we have the natural desire to be the guardians of the coast. Uh, and, and my last my last call really is that there's a, uh, there is an awful lot of high level thinking around this, but we need to make sure that we take our citizens with us. There is absolutely no point of us all just having policy circles and then just being policy circles with, you know, great respect. I love the PhDs and I love people who've got the academic knowledge, but if we don't take our citizens with us, we will be just you know, we will be like King Canoe and try and hold back the tides of irrelevance. Yeah, we, we need to take our citizens and we need to mobilise them. And I think the greatest opportunity we have is with our with, these, with the English coastal path. You know, for the first time in our history, we, we will have a physical asset that unites us. And what we have to do, what our responsibility is, is to make sure that that physical asset builds coast, coastal solidarity so that no more do we feel fragmented and that we work together and start changing how our government of any persuasion looks at our coast and looks at our citizens who live here. Well, that do, Fernanda. Thank you so much, Sasha. Um, and again, um, just so everyone knows, Sasha is not <laughs> very well at the moment, but I'm wishing you a very speedy recovery for you and your thank family. You. Um, and I really appreciate you joining us um, today. Um, thank you to all the speakers. I know we've gone a little bit over time. Um, I'm sorry about that. It's entirely my fault. Again, um, I take full responsibility uh, for the organization of the webinar and not being able to go into our discussion and questions. But I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to all these different uh, amazing perspectives um, and like, like I said, important issues around our coast. Please continue the conversation. I will be sending an email to everyone who registered to the webinar, whether they were able to attend or not, with the relevant links to all of this work. Um, and also um, with links um, for once we put the webinars up 
um, live. So if you miss the other ones, we will be putting making them all available as well. Um, and yes, just the final thing for me is just I really hope that um, the conversation continues um, and that as, as Dan and many others said, you know, that, that we just focus on action. Now, I think we've been talking about these things for too long. There is loads happening already. So just join in where you can um, to get things moving and to get things happening. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, and yes, that's it. <laughs> I, will, I will close it up just so you can see our speakers one final time. Thank you everyone. <laughs>